welcome everyone. This is Dr. Mercola, and today I'm here with Dr. William Harris, who is a research professor at the Sanford School of Medicine in South Dakota. And he is an expert in the analysis and determination of omega threes in your body, and we all know the benefits of those, and I'm sure we'll review view them here shortly. Uh, but Dr. Uh, Harris has uh, is a is a prolific researcher and very well published in some of the major peer reviewed scientific journals, and really is an established authority in this field, and really has helped uh, identify uh, ways that we can determine if we're getting enough of this valuable nutrient. So, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Harris. Well, thank you for having me. So why, why don't you expand on what your specific uh, areas of research are and, and how you got into this whole uh, science of, of, of uh, determining uh, omega-3 uh, uh, levels in, in people? Sure. Uh, it, it, the story goes back to my postdoc. I, I got a, a Ph.D. in nutrition from uh, University of Minnesota back in the 70s and did a postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Bill Connor in Portland, Oregon. And one of the first assignments that Dr. Connor gave me as a new PhD was uh, figure out what salmon oil does to uh, blood cholesterol level in people. Because we really didn't know. Mm -hmm. uh, back in those days, we knew that vegetable oils were good for you. They lowered your cholesterol. We knew that animal fats raised your cholesterol, and that was bad. Uh, but we didn't know what fish oils did. They were kind of somewhere in the middle. They were liquid, but they were from an animal, so it didn't, you know, uh, wasn't clear. So I did some of my original studies uh, there, and we found that um, the omega-3 fatty acids in fish oil lowered uh, triglyceride levels in the blood. Um, we thought we were looking for a cholesterol effect, but really we saw a triglyceride effect. Uh, it's a different blood lipid. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that point, we started to learn about the Eskimo studies that had been done by Dyerberg and Bang uh, in Greenland and how the high omega-3 diet of the Eskimo was uh, apparently what protected them uh, from heart attacks, uh, despite having a, a really what we would have considered a lousy diet mm -hmm. uh, in those days. Um, so that got people interested in beyond uh, the effects of omega-3 beyond on just blood cholesterol and blood triglyceride levels. And uh, so it's just, just snowballed since then. Uh, really, the I've stayed with the omega-3 story. I've had uh, now five grants from the NIH to study omega-3 fatty acids. And about uh, coming on 10 years ago, um, came up with the idea that, that blood levels of omega-3 fatty acids uh, might be actually useful as a for people to measure, and it's sort of like a risk factor, mm -hmm. um, sort of like we measure cholesterol levels in people now, like I was talking about, or we measure blood pressure, or we measure blood sugar. Uh, the doctor always does that so that he can uh, estimate if people are at risk for particularly cardiovascular disease. High cholesterol levels mean high risk for heart disease, and so when you have a high cholesterol, the doctor wants you to do something about it, change your diet, take a drug, whatever. Uh, the omega-3 level in the blood is also something that you can measure, um, and it also gives you information about your risk for heart disease and probably other things as well. And so we proposed back in 2004 now that the omega-3 level, we call the omega-3 index, which is uh, measured in red blood cells, which is a easy to get at type blood sample. We measure the omega-3 level in red blood cells as a reflection of the omega-3 levels in all the tissues. And we uh, then use that to help people um, figure out if their omega-3 levels are too low. Uh, we really haven't seen too high, so uh, that's not apparently a problem. Um, so that's kind of how it, it, it quickly evolved into uh, actually using omega-3 levels, not just as a marker of how much fish you eat, but as an actual risk factor. Well, excellent. And uh, prior to your uh, research and development of this assay, there really wasn't a commercial test that one could use uh, to to quantify this. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's basically the, the, the situation. And there wasn't much research uh, that would allow you to say a certain level was associated with a certain kind of risk, a certain amount of risk. And that's what we've been trying to develop. 
And the red blood cell as a marker for the omega-3 uh, fat level is uh, somewhat comparable to uh, a test that we use for diabetes, which is hemoglobin A1C or glycosylated hemoglobin, which also uses red blood cells and, the, and uh, is able to allow us to give a good summary of what a diabetic's control is for the past three months because the typical red blood cell lasts for about three months. So similarly, uh, your assay is a is a shows a, an average of the la- what what the consumption has been for the last three months, um, so it's it's not easily influenced by a large fish meal the, the night before the test. That's correct, and and that's a great example, a great analogy for uh, physicians to understand. So it, it's a useful tool, and and so you've been doing this test for about ten years, and. Uh, collected a, a large amount of uh, information from the people you surveyed. I'm wondering if you could let us know how many people you've sampled so far and some of the highlights of the information that you've uh, uncovered from this analysis. Oh, yeah, sure. We've uh, we've done two major studies, uh, or in the midst of two major studies, uh, one with what's called the Framingham study, uh, which is a large uh, group of individuals in uh, the Boston area who've been tracked for their health um, Health and risk factors for many many years, and we're also uh, and so about about 3,000 samples there. We've done about 7,000 samples uh, from a research point of view in a group called the, the Women's Health Initiative, which is a large, even obviously much larger trial that has looked at. Uh, in that study, we're looking at the relationship between uh, the omega-3 index and the development of uh, what we call cognitive decline loss of mental function as women age. Um, so, it, and, and again, these studies are in process. Uh, mm-hmm. We're still doing the analysis. Uh, before that, we've done some studies with a few thousand people uh, and published them uh, looking at people who were admitted to the hospital with a heart attack, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would get blood samples from people when they got admitted to the hospital. We measured the omega-3 level, and we compare that uh, omega-3 level to other people who are in every other way just like those folks who were admitted to the hospital, except they weren't having a heart attack. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is what we call a case control study. The cases are the people who are having the heart attack, the controls are people who are not. And we looked at the difference in omega-3 levels and found that those people who had heart attacks were much more likely to have a low level, a low a level meaning under 4%. Um, and I guess I maybe should explain how these numbers work because we th- we think uh, we express the omega-3 index, the amount of omega-3 in the red cell, as a percent. It's a percent of all the fatty acids in the membrane. And the omega-3s typically run from, say, 2% to 10%. That's the, the scale. Uh, we think a level under 4% puts you at high risk and somewhere between Four and eight percent, roughly, is an intermediate risk, and then over eight percent is really the low risk area, the target value we do, that we aim for. And so we looked in this group of, of individuals who were having heart attacks or not, and found that those people who were having the heart attacks actually had were much more likely to have an omega-3 index in that under four target, and very unlikely to have an omega-3 level up in that eight range where we think it's good. Uh, so that's one of the first studies we we looked at. Uh, another study was we looked at the relationship between the omega-3 level and what they call cellular aging. Um, we, we all know what aging is uh, because we just look at the calendar and we get older. Uh, that's that's what we call chronological aging, time-based aging. But you, everybody, each individual ages at a different rate because we don't all live the same number of years, and some people age faster than others. And there is a test that is uh, a little controversial, but it's it's being used more and more, um, and it's called telomer, uh, measuring the length of telomeres, which is a section of the DNA that's in everybody's, each and every cell in every body. Mm-hmm. And we can tell at, as the, uh, if we look over time, over a five-year span of time, we can measure the loss of telomeres in the DNA, and the more telomer that's lost, the faster the cell's aging is the general way of looking at it. And so we have a marker then of aging, cellular aging, 
And we looked in this study at the omega-3 level in the blood of these people uh, and then compared that omega-3 level with how fast their cells aged over five years. And we found that those people had the lowest level of omega-3, the under 4%. Their cells aged faster, much faster than the people who had omega-3 levels up in the 8%. So well, it seemed to be a marker of aging, actually. Sure. Well, that's, that's a really interesting observation. We've uh, discussed that on our site before. I think the, the telomeres appear from the experts I've interviewed to be probably the most accurate biological clock that we have. And uh, mm -hmm. the theory is that once you reach a certain limit, uh, uh, maybe about 5,000 base pairs, I believe, uh, you just don't stay around any longer. You're just dead. So, so <laughs> this is. I, I wasn't aware that the omega threes were associated with uh, improvement in longe in uh, or decrease in the shortening of the telomeres because yeah. you know re really the central area of re telomere research right now is to see if you can uh, activate telomerase to actually increase the telomeres and, and essentially reverse aging. But that's, that's true, and, and there may be a relationship with omega threes in activating telomerase. We yeah. Don't know that. Well, it's, well, certainly, it sounds like the initial research is very promising, and, and if one is interested in delaying aging, <laughs> this would seem a very good strategy, uh, you know, from that perspective, in addition to the, the details you found uncovered with respect to the leading cause of death, which is heart disease. Yeah, yeah. And interestingly, in the same study that we looked at the rate of aging in the cells, we actually measured, uh, we did, as we call, body counts. We measured how many people died. <clears throat> and found that those people who had the higher omega-3 levels uh, died at a slower rate, were less likely to die within the st study period than the people who had low omega-3. So that fits with the idea that the rate of telomer changing actually correlates with the rate of death, which is an important factor. Yeah, that's exciting. And, uh, of course, uh, the, the number one cause of death for most people is heart disease. Uh, mm -hmm. But the following close behind, and in some groups even higher, would be cancer. So have you looked at the influence of uh, omega-3s in cancer? We have not. We have not. That's uh, you, You're absolutely right. That's a, a, a great area of potential research. It's been difficult. Um, many people have looked at omega-3 in cancer, uh, in human cancer uh, studies, and in not found a strong, nearly as strong or clear a signal as we've seen in heart disease hmm. uh, with reducing risk for cancers. There may be a few uh, specific cancers that uh, are um, more more related to having a low omega three, but it's not uh, it's, it's not been a slam dunk at all in the cancer area. Okay. Uh, the the other question I was a bit surprised to hear is that. Uh, you, there didn't seem to, from your research to be an upper limit of um, adverse effects. And, and that's somewhat unusual in nutrition, and obviously you, you have a Ph.D. in that. But it, typically, of course, it, it's, it's easy to overdo any specific nutrient. And uh, I'm, I'm surprised that uh, an overconsumption of, of uh, these, these uh, omega, animal three omega, uh, omega-3 animal fats wouldn't have some complications. I'm wondering if you've... You know how how uh, specifically you've you've analyzed that and what what your comments are on it. Uh, it's a great question, um, and it is a puzzle that I've puzzled about myself. Uh, why have we not seen a a upper limit of toxicity level? Um, it, part of that may be that there's fish oil is not all that tasty, and a lot of people just don't want to eat very much of it. So, we in America we don't see high levels of omega-3, like you see in uh, Greenland Eskimos or like you see in Japan, for example. Uh, 